In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving you the opportunity to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank You for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. Matthew 16:23. I know we went over this uh, a bit last time, but... Uh, some of you are paying attention and told me I missed half of it, and that happens a lot, so I'll go back over it. 16.23, But he turned, actually whirled, and said to Peter, Go away, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, because you do not think divine viewpoint. That's the actual translation. But human viewpoint. I know I explained it, but I just didn't give you the exact translation. Go away, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, because you do not think divine viewpoint but human viewpoint. And we studied how uh, Peter was humanizing our Lord. Even though he is in humanity, he was uh, treating him as an equal and got in deep involved in uh, arrogance. Even though he was sincere about it, he, it doesn't matter. He's still just as arrogant and still just as much sinning. Then in, uh, Now we'll just uh, skip ahead to uh, where I was, and that is 1625, which says, for whoever desires to save his soul, that is, through salvation, they desire to save their soul, that's through positive volition. They've expressed it. And any time anyone expresses positive volition uh, at God consciousness, uh, God the Father will provide the gospel, the hearing of the gospel. And then they'll have a choice to uh, either accept it or reject it. And we know common grace and efficacious grace and how that works in those situations. For whoever desires to save his soul, expression of positive volition after God consciousness, uh, and they will have salvation once they have faith alone in Christ alone, will lose it. And that's referring to the fact that they must live their protocol spiritual life. And when you do so, that does away with living for yourself, but instead you're filled with God the Holy Spirit and you're utilizing all of those assets that you've been given at the moment of salvation. 39 irrevocable assets plus one plus the uh, two power options, the three spiritual skills, the four spiritual mechanics, the ten problem-solving devices, all of which we've studied in some detail, and we'll go back over them uh, to refresh your memory in the future. And these are the things where you lose your uh, life, as it were, or lose your soul, but uh, what you're really losing is the, the fact that you're now functioning under the power of the filling of God the Holy Spirit and no longer functioning under uh, Satan's cosmic system. And then we uh, shift subjects here. And even though it's the same word in the English, uh, the more comes out in the Greek. And you can never underemphasize the importance of Greek because if you were to just read this in your English Bibles, you wouldn't understand anything from it. I, I sure as heck didn't myself when I uh, read it straight from the English. There's just... Uh, and I picked up on you need to be saved and the, the spiritual life, but then there's a whole subject change. But whoever loses his soul, and this is the subject change, and what they've done is uh, they've moved into legalism on the basis of human good. On account of me, we'll uh, find it. And uh, that is, they started out in legalism and human good, but they lost it. And how did they lose it? By coming to faith alone in Christ alone. And as I told you, it's one of the hardest things for religious people and legalistic people to do is to come to faith alone in Christ alone because they have to set themselves aside. It's not them saving themselves. It's not their works. And this is actually what it means. It's, it's simply talking about faith alone in Christ alone and the fact that it's very, very difficult for anyone in religion, anyone in legalism, to let go of themselves and say, I'm not saved because of uh, what I've done. Most people want to tout what they do. And most people want to say, I'm saved or I'm a good Christian. That comes out a lot. I'm a good Christian because I tithe. I'm a good Christian because I do this and that and the other thing. And if an unbeliever can do it, it's not the spiritual way of life. And unbelievers can give 10% of their income to any church they want, and it happens every Sunday. There are unbelievers giving 10% to a church, and they're still bound for hell. And they're holding on to themselves. 
They're holding on to their own uh, souls, as it were, saying, I will get into heaven based on who and what I am, and it's all based upon what Christ is going to do on the cross that is looking forward to it at this point, since he hasn't gone yet. And this is how he's teaching them. And, and uh, when you find it, on account of me, we'll find it. What do you find when you believe in Christ? Well, if you continue in positive volition, this is referring to the utilization of the unique spiritual life, utilizing the protocol spiritual life. You're following in the Lord's footsteps, following in the prototype. And that's what uh, this actually refer refers to. Uh, this verse is dealing with both salvation and post-salvation epistemological rehabilitation. And uh, you should understand those terms by now. And then in 1626, For what does it benefit a person if he gains the whole world but lose his soul? Or what can a person give in exchange for his soul? And what can a person give for exchange uh, for his soul? Nothing. And uh, in fact, this exchange is referring to the fact that only Jesus Christ can be the exchange He's the exchange. He went to the cross, died spiritually as a substitute for us. He is the exchange for our souls. Now, what can a man do? All that wealth, it doesn't do anything. Uh, it's all left behind when they die, and if they've never believed in Christ, they go to hell. It's not saying that those who are uh, wealthy and who have seen to gain the whole world that they're going to hell. There's lots of wealthy people uh, who uh, died and went to heaven. Abraham, for one, very wealthy. And uh, even though, even when Abraham made mistakes and big ones, such as uh, having sex outside of marriage with Hagar, his wife told him he could do it and encouraged him do, to do so, but he didn't need much encouragement. And uh, he, he did so willingly and gladly, probably. And then, uh, as a result of all of that, he ended up, uh, even with, uh, uh, not as a result of that, but he ended up with more blessing in spite of that. And when he went down to Egypt and was going to give away uh, his sister, as he called her, his wife, well, he ended up leaving there, even though he showed no integrity, and the unbelieving ruler of Egypt at that time showed more integrity. Didn't matter. He ended up leaving with uh, all the cattle that the Egyptian uh, pharaoh had given him. So every time he screwed up uh, by grace, he kept on getting more wealthy. So it doesn't deal with wealth. It's not down on people who make money. It's not down on the rich. It's just saying that what exchange is there? We can't purchase our salvation. A week if we were Bill Gates billionaires, we could not purchase our salvation. And you say, well, that's understandable. But uh, just think about how many people do try to purchase their salvation. And then if they're not trying to purchase their salvation, they're trying to uh, purchase uh, some uh, type of leeway from God. I don't know how many people I've come in contact with in this area, not just Anderson. I haven't been in contact with many people in Anderson, but Spartanburg, where I had contact with people, uh, they would say, I've been richly blessed because I've tithed. You're trying to purchase blessing from God. And this verse is uh, teaching against that. There is no exchange. for what, And the only exchange is Christ. That's why you have to give up yourself. You have to give up your works. Because the exchange rate for salvation is Jesus Christ. There is no other exchange rate. So this is the price needed to purchase your soul. And what our Lord is uh, continuing to teach the hard-headed disciples is that He must go to the cross in order to be the exchange rate for people's souls. He must do it. And Peter's all upset saying, No, Lord, don't do it. And uh, accepting Him into His society and being very arrogant and trying to instruct the Lord when He should be listening to the Lord. Uh, but He did uh, too much uh, thinking on His own when He didn't have much to think with and didn't do too much listening. And so, but Peter gets, uh, gets out of all this and grows in grace and goes farther than uh, any of us probably will ever, ever go. Not probably, but uh, uh, most certainly. So only Christ can be the exchange. And when we believe, uh, your soul is purchased. When you believe in Christ, guess what? You've accepted the exchange rate and you've been purchased. You've been bought with a price. And you are our Lord's possession. And He's not going to cast you in the garbage can. And just because uh, you as His possession might screw around and screw up, He knew about that in eternity past. Doesn't doesn't change the fact that He's purchased you. He purchased you knowing that. And uh, for people to think they can lose their salvation don't understand the omniscience of God. 
They don't understand that God knew them in eternity past, everything they would do. And knowing all the stupid things we would do, myself included, we were still purchased. And He knew that. And we were purchased. That shows a great love, and it takes us out of the equation. No way we can uh, do anything as an exchange. No way we can be good little girls and good little boys to get into heaven. No way. The exchange has been made, and it, it doesn't deal with us. We were the ones purchased. And there wasn't much we could offer to sell ourselves either. All we were were a bunch of sin natures uh, without uh, deserving anything. So as a believer, you can live as unto yourself by rejecting the power sphere. That is, the two power options. You can live as unto yourself as a believer. Now, 16.25 tells us we shouldn't from the fact that it tells us we must be saved. And when we're saved, we must then follow up by living the spiritual life. But people who do that are far and few between. It's, it's very far and few between, but that's the protocol. And that's the modus operandi for all of us as believers. But as a believer, you can live as unto yourself by rejecting the unique spiritual life, by rejecting the power of God the Holy Spirit, or by neglecting your unique spiritual life. And when you neglect or reject the Word of God, you're living on your own in the energy of the flesh. Because if you neglect it, well, you might know some of these things, but eventually you'll forget it because the rate of learning must always exceed the rate of forgetting. And when you start forgetting these things, you'll start forgetting exactly that this is a sin and that is a sin. You'll find yourself in carnality more often. And by doing so, you've rejected the power sphere and you have, uh, uh, as it now you are, living as unto yourselves, just like the Laodiceans did. Laodiceans were very wealthy. You can read about them in Revelation. And they failed completely because they got distracted. And that's the way it is in this country. We've been greatly blessed uh, because we have such a preponderance of believers possessing the righteousness of God. And from that comes lots of blessings. And then on top of that, we have had uh, large pivots in the past. It's small now or even non-existent almost. And so uh, some of these blessings will go away in order to wake us up. Natural disasters sometimes are used to wake up countries. And uh, this one coming, as I said in the first message, it's, uh, even if it doesn't strike New Orleans directly, it's striking oil uh, facilities directly. And you know how dependent we are now on oil. And 25% of all of our oil comes from the Gulf. And in 2004, when the last hurricane came through there that wasn't even as strong as this one, uh, some of those oil refineries, which we have not built since 1972, were in such disrepair that they fell apart, and it took them four months to get them up and running. And in 2004, gas prices went up. And now, uh, this huge hurricane, it's going to be inevitable. And you might not see it at the pump immediately, but by this time next week, you will. And it might come right back down. I'm not a prophet or anything. These are just uh, natural things of economy that you understand. When the supply is cut off, prices go up. And the supply is cut off right now because they all had to leave the oil rigs. And now they're going to get all tore up. Then they got to come back and fix them. And uh, they won't build anymore because environmentalists won't let them. Goody two-shoes. Human good, you see. It's destructive of freedom. And this is exact, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to start hurting our wallets if it isn't already. And uh, it, it will, especially if you have to drive a lot and you do that for your job. It's going to start affecting everything from airline tickets to the stuff that you buy in the grocery store that was shipped in on a truck. Everything will start going up and uh, incomes won't. And so you can see there will be a problem with that. They could be a lot worse, but all these are warning signs. Of course, natural disasters have always been used uh, by the Lord to wake up people. And now we move on to the transfiguration. And the transfiguration, I know your Bibles say it starts in uh, chapter 17, uh, but they should have uh, uh, done it before that. But I'll finish that. Uh, but I did finish the 1626, right? Yeah. I did go through that. Okay. I'm just wondering why I got a confused look. So the transfiguration actually begins in 1627. That might be where the confused look came from. And your Bibles might put it all the way at 17. This is actually where 17 should begin. And remember, the numbering of the verses was never divinely inspired. 
Uh, that's just something that people added so they could find their place easily. So 1627 is actually the beginning of our Lord changing subjects and going to talk about the transfiguration. 1627, for the Son of Man, and every time you see Son of Man, it's an emphasis on the humanity of Christ. Remember, there's the humanity of Christ, and then there's the deity of Christ in hypostatic union. The Son of Man emphasizes the humanity of Christ. For the Son of Man is destined to come. Now, this is referring to the second advent. It's referring to uh, the baptism of fire, actually. That's going to occur at the second advent. It's when our Lord's actually going to touch foot on the earth. Now, our Lord's going to come down in the sky at the resurrection for us. And uh, that's not really the first or second advent. That's just the resurrection. The first advent was when our Lord was born onto the earth. Second advent, when our Lord touches feet on the earth. So for the Son of Man is destined to come at the second advent in the glory of His Father with His angels. And then He will reward each one on the basis of their production. Now this isn't referring to each one of us. Uh, When do we receive our evaluation? When do we receive our rewards? Uh, During the tribulation. This is after the tribulation. So this isn't referring to us. It's referring to Old Testament believers and tribulational martyrs. This is when the Old Testament believers receive their rewards. And you might have always wondered, well, I know we receive ours. Are the Old Testament believers going to be at the Bema too? No. That's specifically for the church age believers. And we come first because we're royal family. And he that is last is first. Who's last? The church age. Who was first? The Old Testament. They get evaluated last. So Old Testament believers and then tribulational martyrs will be evaluated on the basis of their production. That's divine good production. That's not human good production, and we know the difference. Divine good for us is when we're filled with God the Holy Spirit. Now in the tribulation, it it uh, resumes the Old Testament way of life in which there's no more uh, filling of God the Holy Spirit, but there will be endowment in the tribulation, just as there was endowment in the Old Testament. And their spiritual life is evaluated on the basis of the faith rest drill only. That's it. That's what they have. That's what David had. That's what he used. That's what Moses used. And they, some of them parlayed the faith rest drill almost into impersonal love, uh, like Moses did, but he still didn't have the higher things that we have. There's no way he could. And this is when they will be evaluated on the basis of their production under the faith rest drill. We too can have production under the faith rest drill, but we must be filled with God the Holy Spirit. And uh, we must uh, grow in grace. And in fact, that's just the beginner stage. Faith rest drill, you're you're a beginner and you should use it. And uh, in fact, with the faith rest drill, you can handle just about every problem there is. But uh, the sophisticated spiritual life is what you're aiming for. And then you really, it's almost like a reflex. When you have the faith rest drill and you're starting out, you've got to recall promises, mix them with faith. But when you're in the sophisticated spiritual life, uh, uh, those recalling a promise, you might not even have to do that. You just know uh, from a doctrinal rationale, which is still part of the faith rest drill, or you might come to a doctrinal conclusion, or somebody does you wrong and you just automatically flip on impersonal love and don't even think about it. And you're occupied with Christ anyway, so uh, these things almost become second nature. It becomes easier, actually, but the tests become more difficult. But they even get easier to pass the more you grow in grace. So then in uh, 1628, it said, your Bibles might say verily, verily, or it might say in truth. In truth is a good translation, but what's that mean? It means he's about to give a point of doctrine. In truth, point of doctrine. There are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Now, who were who was there? Well, the disciples were there. And He uh, says some of them. This some refers to Peter, James, and John. Now, these are the ones who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. And you say to yourself, and it would be wise to say this, and it would show that you were thinking, but the second advent's not going to occur for at least another 2,000 years, if not much longer. What's this mean? Now, Peter and James and John would still be standing around. No, it, it's simply referring to the fact that our Lord is going to give them a preview of coming attractions. 
It's like uh, seeing a snippet out of a movie before it comes out. And you go to the theater and you look at the screen and they'll have previews, lots of previews, and they'll show a snippet of a movie. Well, they're going to get to see a snippet of the second advent. Our Lord's going to show it to them. And uh, they're going to see it just as it's uh, going to happen in a small segment. And that is going to... Uh, and this is going to happen, by the way, in six days. In six days, this is uh, when they are going to see the transfiguration. And in 17.1, you see uh, six days. Now, the six days is analogous to the first six years of the tribulation. There's a lot of dispensational things going on in Matthew, and we have to understand this. The six days deal with the first six years of the tribulation. Six days later. Now, we can get something out of this. Uh, our Lord said, uh, Peter, James, and John... Uh, he didn't name them out specifically, but uh, they, they knew later on. And Peter, James, and John, you're going to be the ones who are going to uh, be with me and see the, and you're going to see the second coming, and you're not going to die until you see it. Well, if Peter, James, and John had been thinking, they could say, my goodness, I'm not going to die for six days. I can just uh, go out and uh, do all those things I've always wanted to do that I was too scared to do. And uh, just go nuts with it. And Peter just start running out into the ocean. Make me walk, Lord. I ain't going to die. You told me. I got six days. I can, I can do whatever. And uh, the point is, uh, fear really uh, keeps us from doing a lot of fun things in life. And there's a point to be derived from that. And they didn't get this point, but I did when I saw it. And just imagine the Lord says, uh, you're not going to die for six, six days. Guaranteed. Well, you might go jump out of airplanes and pull a parachute and see how that feels. Or do something else that, uh, that you think is thrilling. Bungee cord jump or whatever. And, uh, and and that might be a little... Sometimes they mess that up. But if it's uh, pretty secure, I guess it'd be all right. Uh, but uh, the, thing, the thing is, fear makes you miss out on life. A lot of things. I missed out on upside-down roller coasters until I was 10, I guess. I just didn't like... I didn't want to go upside-down. And my grandpa finally got me to get on it, and I did it, and then I kept on doing it because it was fun. I was missing out on something out of fear. Nobody's ever fallen out of that thing. Uh, if anything, the other roller coaster uh, caused more problems that didn't go upside down than that one ever did. And so we do miss out in life. But the, the point is, they're not going to die till they see the transfiguration. And that's what he's saying. Six days later, Jesus took him, Peter, uh, took with him Peter, James, and John. That's how we know that those are the three that are that he's talking about in 1628. And Peter, James, and John are a perfect picture of the Jewish remnant alive on the earth. Notice Judas is not in, included in here. And this is a picture of the Jewish remnant alive on the earth. Those uh, Jewish uh, believers in the tribulation. And led them on a high mountain. And this is probably Mount Tabor in the Hermon Range. And uh, it's very beautiful up there. And uh, I love to go to mountains. I love to go to Mount Mitchell. And I used to live closer to it, but I would go any uh, time I felt relaxed and wanted to go up there and look at it. I don't know if many of you have been, but it's the, it's the highest point on the East Coast. It's uh, 6,680-some feet high. And uh, its climate is about like that of northern Canada. And I looked at their temperature up there the other day in the middle of the summer, 58 degrees with rain. That's, that's pretty chilly. And then it, they've even had snow flurries in uh, August recorded on Mount Mitchell. And that's just in North Carolina. And uh, it was two hours from Spartanburg. I don't know how far <laughs> it is from here. Uh, but uh, mountains are always beautiful. They're wonderful places to be. You really get away from civilization. And uh, for Peter... This was a time when he was getting away from a lot of criticism. What have the Pharisees always been doing down in the city? Nip, 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 and it, it just uh, tore Peter up. He couldn't stand it. He couldn't handle criticism. He didn't have enough doctrine to handle it. And uh, he was always tore up in knots. So when he got up on this mountain, this high mountain, he finally uh, felt as if he got away from everything. And he's there with the people he likes, James and John. And uh, him and John were like brothers. They were really uh, close to each other. And uh, Jesus was there, and of course, he, he loved our Lord. And so he was there with all these people and was enjoying himself. 
And then in 17.2, uh, now, now this is probably Mount Tabor, as I said, and he led them up there on the high mountain by themselves. Now in 17.2, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as transparent as light. Now what is this all about? Our Lord was transfigured. This means uh, He is going to make Himself, or God the Father is going to make Himself look just exactly as He is going to look at the second advent. So get, they got to see a preview of how our Lord is going to look at the second advent. And His face is going to shine like the sun. And His clothes are going to be as transparent as light. And obviously a phenomenal thing that they were seeing here with their very own eyes. And I want you to write that part down there if you're taking notes. They, Peter saw this with his own eyes. Peter, James, and John, they all saw it with their own eyes. But we're going to find out that them seeing it with their own eyes isn't going to mean a thing. And Peter is going to make a big issue out of this in Second Peter because he's going to say, and this is going to be the first time he talked about it. And he's about to, he's almost going to be dead, and he's going to be writing Second Peter, and he's going to say for the he's first for the first time he's going to mention this transfiguration. And what he's going to say is, I saw it with my eyeballs, but I see it in the Word of God, and that is more impressive to me than seeing it empirically. And that is a tremendous point, meaning that doctrine is more powerful than seeing anything such as this, which would be tantamount to a miracle. And this is, and we'll get into that, and it's, it's going to be a phenomenal study on the change of Peter, for one thing, and how he focuses on doctrine finally. Now he's all human viewpoint. So he sees the Lord transfigured. Then in 17.3, Then Moses and Elijah also appeared to them, conversing with him, conversing with the Lord. Now Moses and Elijah are the two witnesses found in Revelation chapter 11. Moses and Elijah will be the heralds of the second advent. And uh, John the Baptist, or the baptizer, by the way, is the herald for the first advent. And there's going to be confusion among the uh, disciples with this later on. But then Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses of Revelation, the heralds of the second advent of Christ, also appeared to them conversing with Him, our Lord. Then in 17.4, this is typical of Peter. He's the spokesman of the group, and he's always sticking his foot in his mouth. He's always saying, he's always talking when he should be listening. That's his personality, very outgoing. I probably would have liked Peter very much. I'm not that much outgoing, but... Uh, that he, he just seems like a likable fellow, but he also seems to get a bit of arrogance under his belt sometimes. And so then Peter spoke up and said, Lord, it is pleasant to be here. That is uh, straight from the Greek. Lord, it is pleasant to be here. And of course it is. It's pleasant to be on Mount Mitchell on a hot, hot summer day. And it's pleasant to be on a mountain with all those beautiful views and it's also pleasant to be seeing Moses and Elijah along with our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this also indicates that um, Peter got his eyes a bit off the Lord. He was very impressed there with Moses and Elijah. Well, he had seen the Lord Jesus Christ for two years straight now. And even though he's the, the Son of God and the God-man, uh, well, Peter has a tendency to get bored. Now he sees Moses and Elijah and gets excited. Man, there's Moses and Elijah. Well, it's, uh, it's almost human nature. Once you've been uh, around uh, someone for uh, so long and then you see something, it, it's human nature. Uh, and the fact is, uh, one time somebody said to me, well, I, I sure am glad to know now that those angels are watching me because uh, those angels, uh, I won't do some of the things I do now that those angels are watching me. And then I said, well, God's been watching you the whole time. You see, it's just people's perspective. And uh, they, they forget we have an intimate relationship with God. And sometimes we uh, take it for granted. And Peter was taking for granted his intimate relationship with the Lord and got excited about Moses and Elijah. And so it's a natural human reaction 
But uh, it shows that he ha he does not yet and will not for quite a while. He does not have occupation with the person of Christ. Lord, it is, it is pleasant to be here if you wish. Now, you don't get much out of that from English because if you wish means uh, usually it's a polite thing to say. If you want to do something, well, uh, if you want to, go ahead. And if Peter would have used that uh, condition then uh, that would have been what he was saying. But uh, in the Greek, if has uh, three uh, different conditions. And this condition says, if you wish, and you do. In other words, Lord, this is what uh, you want to do, and this is what I want. Lord, it is pleasant to be here. If you wish, and you do, I will make three tents here. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. I don't know about you, but when I read that, uh, I used to, I've laughed about this for years. Here's Jesus Christ and uh, Moses and Elijah. God the Father's there too, and we'll see that in a minute. God the Father's going to scare the bejesus out of uh, old Peter here. He's going to freak. And uh, so here we have uh, this going on, and he wants to make tents. Moses and Elijah are coming down from uh, paradise, or coming up from paradise. They don't want to sleep in a tent on earth. And our Lord has a ministry to fulfill, and He doesn't care anything about a tent. And uh, just notice how many times has uh, Peter volunteered to make a tent for the Lord. Usually it's the Lord the one trying to tell Peter what to do. Pass out the fish, pass out the bread. And, and now Peter's saying, you know what Peter's doing? He's trying to bribe the Lord. He's saying... Uh, Lord, if you, uh, it's pleasant here, and if you wish to be here, and I know you do, guess what? If we stay up here, I'll make three tents. I don't even care about myself. I'll make a tent for you. I'll make a tent for Moses. And I'll make a tent for Elijah. He's trying to bribe the Lord's what he's doing. He's saying, you don't even have to do anything. As if he's forgotten who, who the... If the Lord wanted to make... He could make three mansions right there if he had to. I mean, this, the guy has, uh, he, well, he's thinking in terms of human viewpoint. You can see that. And he has, as it were, uh, well, he's trying to run the show. And he's trying to take away our Lord's authority. Although he does it very politely, well, that's the way to, um, well, he's obviously read some books on how to win people and influence them. Uh, that's Peter. And he says, well, but he's not dealing with any ordinary man. He's dealing with Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ knows what he's up to. But this time, Jesus Christ doesn't have to say anything. And that's because uh, Peter's about to be shocked out of his buddy-buddy type attitude with Jesus. And he thinks he's an equal with the Lord, and he can instruct the Lord on what to do. And he will be the one, he'll be the spokesperson for the Lord's ministry. And the Lord's ministry would go great, if, 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 and this is obviously what he was thinking. And the Lord's ministry would go great if he would just let me uh, take hold of it. And uh, I'll let him teach, because he knows more than me, but uh, I'll tell him where to go and how to do it. And he's really, he's really being blasphemous and being very insulting uh, by doing this. And also that something comes out of this is that Peter thinks that happiness is in circumstances. He finally got away from the nagging Pharisees. He finally got up to where he could be with Moses and Elijah. And so he, he considers this a pleasant environment happiness. And pleasant environment doesn't mean happiness. Uh, happiness comes from within, not from the circumstances that are without. And also what it shows is that Peter has a tendency to uh, be braggadocious. You know what he wants to do? He wants to stay up there with Moses and Elijah, and he wants to run down that mountain and tell all his buddies, the other disciples, as you see, there's only three there. He's going to rub it in that he got to see Moses and Elijah. And not only did he get to see Moses and Elijah, uh, they stayed there in a tent that he built for them. He's a, a name dropper. A lot of people are name droppers. Uh, I met with, or somebody might say, I met with the president yesterday and I gave him some uh, good advice here and there and uh, that's why he's doing what he's doing now. And a lot of people are name droppers and they use other people. And a lot of people stand outside of Crawford, Texas, on both sides of the issue, looking for attention from a media uh, so that uh, they can think they have some influence. Neither side does. Uh, the president does, they don't. 
And uh, so, uh, this is exactly what's occurring here. He, uh, Peter wants to be a name dropper. As if the Lord wasn't enough, he's going to, uh, well, Moses and Elijah. People, what he's thinking, people will really listen to me now that I've seen Moses and Elijah. Now they'll criticize you all the more and say you're crazy. But he doesn't think like that. And then in 17.5, uh, while he was still speaking, notice, Peter is still jabbering while he was still speaking. And if you've been studying with me through Matthew, that seems to be the only thing Peter can do is talk. He never listens. He's got wax in his ears and he just blah, 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 blah. So while he was still speaking, a bright cloud surrounded them. And a voice from the cloud said, Now this is God the Father. Now Peter thought Jesus had been a little rough with him, but now he's going to see something that's going to terrify him. And this is going to make a lasting impression on Peter for the rest of his life. This is my beloved Son, in whom I take great delight. You listen to Him. Now he's getting rebuked by God the Father. Now how many of us can ever say, you see he could brag about this, and uh, he probably never did, but if in his spiritual maturity he could say, I was the only disciple ever chewed out by God the Father and God the Son. <laughs> and he certainly was. He, he most certainly was. And, but this, uh, well, obviously, uh, God the Father came down with that great light, something outside of his frame of reference. And obviously the uh, voice wasn't sweet. If 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 it was if it was God the Father saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased and I take great delight, you listen to him, he wouldn't have been he wouldn't have had this reaction. And this is his uh reaction in seventeen six. Not only his, but all the others there. Uh, Peter, uh, James and John. When the disciples heard this, they were terrified and fell down with their faces to the ground. Obviously, this was a stern command, very loud, and very much outside of their frame of reference. Uh, all of this light going on and just terrified. They probably thought they were about to die. They were about to get struck by the finger of God the Father and depart from the earth. But uh, God the Father was just... Uh, well, he, he, well, God the Father here helped out our Lord by being uh, very tough and uh, really making it clear, hey guys, he's told you to, that you need to listen to him. Now I'm going to tell you, you listen to him. And now we have something phenomenal in 17.7. Now our Lord doesn't have to be chewing him out, and I'm sure our, our Lord is appreciative that he doesn't have to chew him out. He's probably sick of chewing these people out. Nobody like, unless they're crazy, nobody likes to chew people out every day. Or all the time. Nobody does, unless they've got a mental problem. And But Jesus seemed to have to do this all the time because they were so hard-headed. But now we see something different. He doesn't have to. And when He doesn't have to, uh, we see something different. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, He said. Do not be afraid. And uh, that's this is one point. Then in 17.8, When they looked up, all they saw was Jesus alone. No more Moses, no more Elijah, no more God the Father, just Jesus. When they looked up, that's all they could see. A perfect reference to occupation with Christ. God the Father made it clear, listen to Him. And now Jesus Christ is making it clear by appearing alone, by saying, you need to be occupied with Me, the person of Christ. And that's the ultimate. And that's the most important thing. And what they had just seen, uh, while it was spe spectacular, the greatest point made was that they needed to have occupation with Christ. And that's the most important. In other words, uh, Peter, James, John, get your eyes on me. Get your eyes off people. And the only reason they were so, or Peter at least, was so ecstatic about uh, uh, Moses and Elijah, he was thinking about people and what he could tell people. And uh, Peter always had his focus on people. He always had a problem with approbation lust, all extending from his arrogance. And we all go through that phase, but we have to grow out of it through grace and by growing in grace and in knowledge. 
And a lot of people get distracted by having their eyes on people when they should have their eyes on the Lord. And I've uh, known people who uh, seemed positive to the word at first, uh, such as when I lived in Austin, Texas. A, a young black fellow was there, and he said, You know, I don't go to these churches because uh, they're just hypocrites. And that everything he said, well, you could just about agree with. But if you uh, think about it, uh, every venue in life are filled with hypocrites. He was working with hypocrites, yet he came to work. But you say, I won't go to church because they're uh, filled with hypocrites. A lot of people use that as an excuse. You know, if a church is teaching doctrine, and sometimes you might want to go up to people and say, well, this church isn't like that, and i.e. this one, and it's not. But you go up and say, this church isn't into all that gossip, maligning, and judging. And uh, people uh, aren't as hypocritical, but all of us here have been in the past, and we know it. And we have sin natures, and people have to learn to deal with that, or they'll never make it with doctrine anyway. And so you tell them all this and they say, well, I don't go to church because it's filled with hypocrites. It's an excuse. They don't care for it. And it's, a, and, it, and it's an excuse because they're hypocritical themselves. They're hypocritical because they go to work with hypocrites and they don't quit doing that. And um, the real motivation for what they say is the fact that they don't want it. They're negative. That's their motivation. And they're being hypocritical by telling you, I don't go to church because they're hypocritical. Well, of course they are. Humans are humans. Just because humans step into a church doesn't mean they lose their uh, old sin nature, dummy. Of course there's hypocrites in church. There's hypocrites everywhere. And we've all been hypocrites, myself included. So uh, the fact of uh, thinking that, well, they have their eyes on people. And if they ever start talking about uh, the hypocrite thing, and I've heard it so much it makes me sick, or uh, uh, people get on that who seem positive because they're, they don't like the legalism. Just because somebody doesn't like legalism doesn't mean they're positive. They just might be antinomian and in conflict with the legalist. And usually that's what it is, and usually that's all of Christianity today. On the one side, the antinomians in conflict with the legalist, And nobody seems to get with the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And that is the real problem. And their eyes are on people, and that is always a problem for anybody. That's just one example. There are many examples of where people get their eyes on people. I mean, you could get your eyes on the, the pastor instead of the message and say, well, that pastor does this and this that I don't like. Well, listen to the message. Uh, I have a sin nature just like every pastor does. I probably use it far less than others, but I won't make that judgment call. But still that we all have old sin natures. Now, 17.9, As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Do not tell anyone about what you have seen until the Son of Man has been resurrected from the dead. And uh, part of this is that our Lord knows that uh, behind all of Peter's motivation and it is his desire to want to Tell the world what he just saw. And uh, it's just Peter's person. I mean, notice, Peter can't keep his mouth shut. Is he going to keep his mouth shut about this unless he's told not to? No. Somebody has, somebody has to tell him, don't do it. And this time, he's going to listen. This is the one time that he is going to listen at such an early uh, stage of his spiritual life. And why? Because he about peed his pants when God the Father shone around him and told him, listen to him. And then right after he said, listen to him, all he saw was Christ. And then after he said, listen to him, this is what Christ said. Don't tell anyone about it until I am resurrected. And Peter will follow that commandment. In fact, he will not say anything about this until well after the resurrection of Christ. Well after it. Well, he's so petrified, he finally gets around to doing it when he's dying. And when he's dying, he says to himself, well, now it's about time for me to tell, uh, tell people about what I saw. But he comes at it now from the angle of being mature. Then he was so immature, he would have just been impressed by Moses and Elijah. Now, when he's older, he tells them all that even though he saw this, what he's really impressed with is doctrine, not what he saw. And we see this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10. 
Now, you're going to be amazed at what doctrine can do for somebody. We've just been talking about Peter, and we've all got a chuckle out of Peter and laughed at him. Well, we're the same way, and we should laugh at ourselves too. And uh, the, that's the point. And no one, none of us should take ourselves too seriously. And when we goof up, laugh at ourselves and move on. Uh, just like we laugh at Peter. We don't, feel, we don't have any animosity toward him. We just laugh. 2 Peter 1.10 now, I'm going to give it to you as it is uh, given uh, straight from the Greek and uh, go ahead and uh, give you some interpretation. 2 Peter 1.10. Remember, this is the same Peter we've been talking about. Because of this, because of this is referring to the doctrine that he's been giving in the last nine verses. Because of this doctrine, brethren, believers, be diligent to make your calling and election a sure thing. Now, you could take that way out of context, and a lot of people do. But uh, what he's saying is, be diligent to make your calling and election a sure thing. It means you know you have eternal security. What this means is you know you're saved. you got the doctrine, and you know it. It's a sure thing in your frontal lobes, in your stream of consciousness. Uh, you see, when you start out as a baby believer and you've been around a lot of legalism, you might not know it to be a sure thing in your frontal lobe, even though it is. And you might, in Acts, when it says, and election a sure thing, it's referring to knowing it in your frontal lobe, referring to knowing it in your stream of consciousness. And this was something that uh, Peter also, obviously, had a problem with. And when he was called Satan, as I said, he probably got pretty shook up about that. But now, in his spiritual adulthood, he knows it's a sure thing that he's going to heaven, and he wants all of those whom he is teaching to know it's a sure thing. Faith alone in Christ alone. Make, it, uh, make sure you understand that in your frontal lobe. By doing this, you will never, ever make false steps in life. That's in 110. By doing this, you will never, ever make false steps in life. And I'm sure Peter could think back about all his false steps but now that he knows doctrine, he says you'll never make false steps. Not saying you'll never sin. A false step deals a lot. It's a lot deeper than just sin. We all sin. False step has to do with a, a deeper thing, such as adikia, which is wrongdoing. And wrongdoing refers to all the human good that we could produce, all the activism that we could do. If you get involved in activism and uh, you go down to Crawford, Texas to change the world by being on the pro-war side of it, which is the side you should be on. And if you did that, that's activism. You're not going to change a thing. You change this country by doctrine, not by activism. Or if you go to an abortion clinic, that's autokia. It's wrongdoing and it's making a false step. You're going in the wrong direction. Now, you can sin and immediately rebound and you're going in the right direction. The sin was wrong, but you're still moving in the right direction. To make a false step means you've just uh, gotten out of line and you're going in the wrong direction, away from the spiritual life, into human good, into the energy of the flesh. Then in 111, For thus an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be freely provided for you. Now, uh, this word, uh, I will all, well, this word here uh, in the, the verb provided, it's a verb that was used in the ancient world for uh, people that would be uh, considered a, a sugar daddy. Somebody had a lot of money and they would pay for the arts. And uh, they didn't think anything about it. It was freely done, no strings attached. They might not even watch the plays. But they would just uh, pull money out of their wallet or whatever they used back then and give it to the Actors Guild or whatever so that they could uh, perform and have a wage and live by being an actor. But there were wealthy people doing it, and they did it freely with no strings attached. And this is what it's saying. Now, you could get a legalist read this passage, and they would come up and say, See there, you've got to make sure you're really going to heaven, and you've got to do this. Well, it's freely given, freely provided by our Lord uh, Jesus Christ. And it's on the basis of grace that is our entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior. One twelve. Therefore, I will always be ready. 
and the principle out of this is God always uses ready people. And who, who are the people who are ready? The people who are ready are people with the Word of God, people with Bible doctrine in their souls. People who aren't ready, well, Peter's ready now, but he wasn't ready when he didn't have doctrine. And he's the same Peter now as he was when he was younger. The only difference is he has doctrine. Before he wasn't ready, now he's ready. And it was all given to him by grace, and he understands this full well. Therefore, I will always be ready to keep reminding you, repetition, concerning these things. These things refer to Eusebiah, the unique spiritual life, and epinosis, that is beyond knowledge. Pneumatica, spiritual phenomena, these things. Although you know them, and you have become stabilized by means of the truth that has come to you, that is, by means of doctrine, and if anything in the world can stabilize you, it's the Word of God. And it will. And then in one thirteen, Moreover, I consider it my solemn duty, as long as I am in this tent. Remember, he was wanting to make three tents back in Matthew. Now he's talking about his own tent. And believe me, right now he's reminiscing about what occurred at the transfiguration. He's thinking about it. And so he uses the same word. And he's probably chuckling to himself, although he's very ill at this point. And that's why Second Peter is one of the hardest for any Greek scholar to interpret because Peter was dying and he became very elliptical. What happens when you start to die? You want to get out the most important points. You leave out verbs. And, and stuff like that, and that's what he's doing. He's leaving out verbs, and he's leaving out prepositions, and he's just putting down main points. So Second Peter is difficult uh, for any Greek student uh, because it is so elliptical, and that's because he's dying, and he knows it. So I consider it my solemn duty as long as I am in this tent, his tent refers to his body, to turn you on by means of repetition. That's repetition of the Word of God. Then in 114, because I know the laying aside of my tabernacle, that's his human tabernacle, his body, is imminent. And that means he knows he's about to die. Just as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, and before the Lord departed from the earth uh, by means of his uh, uh, death on the cross, he, he told Peter exactly what was going to happen to him and exactly how he was going to die. And he knew, it was, he knew he was dying. He knew he was going to. The Lord had told him. And then in 115, in fact, and what is he thinking about when he's dying? Doctrine. And that's because he made it. If you're, if you're dying and you're not thinking about doctrine, you're worried and you're upset and you're tore up and you just can't handle it and you'll fall all apart. But uh, he's dying and he's thinking doctrine. And in fact, he's applying it now more than he ever has before. In fact, I will also be diligent that you uh, be diligent that you at any time after my departure will have the doctrine resident in your soul that you may be able to recall them. And that's Im the important thing to have your uh, to remember doctrine to be able to have your rate of learning exceed your rate of forgetting. Then in one sixteen, for we did not follow cleverly de devised myths when we taught you the power of and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we became eyewitnesses. This is the first time he's opened his mouth concerning what happened on the day of transfiguration. He's dying. Now he's going to talk about it. And this time he's got the right attitude about it. And this time he's not all uh, name-dropping. This time he says, it's not that important that I was an eyewitness. But we became eyewitnesses. They saw the empirical happening of the, the second advent of His Majesty. 117. For when He received honor and glory from God the Father, such a voice as this carried to Him by the majestic glory, This is my beloved Son in whom I take great delight. He didn't go on to say, now, now listen to Him, because... Uh, that was it left a bad taste in his mouth, and we can understand that. And God the Father chewed him out, and he's just not going to write that in his epistle. One eighteen. Furthermore, we, and that's referring to Peter, James, and John, heard this voice which was being transmitted from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And yet we keep on having 
a more reliable. Now, that should take you aback. He saw it with his own eyes. Now he says, and yet we keep on having a more reliable prophetic prophetic doctrine. In other words, epinosis doctrine. Eusebiah, living the spiritual life, getting the doctrine from the Bible, listening to your pastor teacher and getting the Word of God is far more important than seeing this empirically. Peter remembers back to when he saw it and he remembers how little impact it had on him at the time. But the more he learned doctrine, the more impact this had on him. And now he's saying, yeah, I saw it. I was an eyewitness. Before, he would have ran down the mountain, I saw it! You didn't see what I saw! And he'd have been all excited. Now he's dying and he says, you know what, I saw it, but there's something more reliable than what you can see with your eyes. And that's doctrine. To which we do well by concentrating on it. Oh, Peter finally learned how to concentrate. Notice before, everybody keep, had to tell him, shut up, listen, shut up, listen, shut up, listen. Now he knows that it's important to concentrate. And he knows that everyone else needs to concentrate. And this is his dying wish. Concentrating on it. That's Bible doctrine. Like a, sh a lamp shining in a dark place until the day is dawn. And that refers to the second advent. So we see how far Peter has come. So excited about seeing Moses and Elijah. Now when he's dying, he is excited most by the Word of God. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank You for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to these things and help us to understand the importance of the Word of God so that we can be like Peter and grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior and so that we might execute the protocol plan of uh, You for our lives. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.